everyone. Welcome to Urban U. I'm Tina Beth Finia. And I'm Ari Goldberg. We're coming to you from the CUNY TV studios to bring you this month's Urban U. You'll learn what exactly a bio blitz is from Macaulay Honors College students, hear poetry written by a Hunter College professor who's traveled to refugee camps, and so much more. But let's take you to our first story, coming to you from the Queen's library system. Prison life means somebody else gets to decide what you eat, when you sleep, what to wear, but deciding what to read, that's a choice that Nilly Ness views as a basic right, and it's a right she wants to make sure everyone has. If you look nationally, it is not common for public libraries to provide service in local jails, probably less than 20%. New York Public Library and Brooklyn Public Library have services, they've done services and continue to do services at Rikers Island. This is new for Queens Library. I'm the first one to have this position for this library, so I'm really glad that we now have a presence as well at the facilities in Rikers Island. Meet Nilly Ness, Queens College graduate and Queens librarian, more specifically, a correctional services librarian. With a grant from the city, New York Public Libraries have been able to offer video visitations, where loved ones can make video calls to inmates from local libraries. And through that funding, Ness has also been able to offer another library service, personally bringing books to the inmates at Rikers Island, a luxury that's easy to take for granted. People are often really excited um, to see the library, especially if it's their first time. They don't know, you know, they didn't even know that this was offered in the, in the jail. Um, and I saw, you know, one guy, he was so excited. I mean, he just lit up completely. And, you know, we started also promoting video visitation. He was like, I don't have anybody to visit me. That's why I need the books. It's very hard to explain for people who don't come in for the service how meaningful it is to people. Explain to me the difference between prisons versus jails, state, local, federal. Rikers is a jail complex. It's 10 facilities, a, a county jail complex. People who are in, in incarcerated in a jail, it's basically people who might be awaiting trial, awaiting sentencing, awaiting transfer to a state or federal prison, or if there's someone who's sentenced for a year and under, they might serve their time at a jail. So at the most basic level, it's a question of how much time you serve. Longer sentences at state and federal prisons shorter stretches at local jails, like Rikers. And with these relatively shorted detention times, combined with other factors like budget restraints, oftentimes jails around the country aren't required to have a library, nor would even have the space for them if they wanted to. So it's no small feat to make this happen. So at a day at Rikers, we would you know, go through security, um, have to put away your phones, you can't bring any technology, and we unlock our books, we have to keep all our books under lock and key. You have to work within what works for the facility, so if they only have two hours for library service because they have other programs, so that's an area, a window of time where you can do that service, and that's the time that you have available. To be sure, it's not as easy as just bringing by a cart of books. Obviously, they can't just give Nilly a key to the facility, so she needs guard escort. There are alarms and lockdowns to work around, and for safety reasons, Nilly even has to cut off the covers before bringing hardcover books in. And because no technology is allowed in, Nilly has to keep track of all the transactions by hand. But the DOC is working with the city's libraries to make it work, recognizing the great work being done here. There's definitely more areas they, they're thinking of that they would like us to be able to provide service to. And you know, part of it is coming up with how do we overcome the logistical issues that might be there. And that's, both sides really are working together to try to overcome those to be able to provide services to as many people as possible. I'm excited about, you know, where we're going forward. Um, I'm not sure how much we can handle because we are a small team, but it's just hard to say no and hard to not like think of what more we could be doing. For most of us, being able to choose any book we'd want to read at any time isn't something we'd even give a second thought to. But for those people where it's a luxury, programs like this at the Queens Public Library are all that much more important. For Urban U, I'm Ari Goldberg. Science happens all around us, and for hundreds of Macaulay Honors College sophomores, science is a walk in the park. Barry Mitchell has that story. Please roll it. Beautiful, lush Inwood Hill Park on the northernmost tip of Manhattan. That's the Hudson River and Henry Hudson Bridge connecting Manhattan and the Bronx. The park contains one of only two salt marshes in Manhattan and the largest remaining natural forest in the borough. It's an encyclopedia of living organisms large and small, the perfect habitat for a bio blitz. Bio blitz, learning about microbes and stuff. Oh, 
A BioBlitz in general is a 24 hour or a specific time period snapshot of the biodiversity in a particular location. At Macaulay, we have an annual BioBlitz every year where our students go out to a specific urban green space. We team them up with scientists and they find as many species as possible that live in that space at that particular 24 hour period. The whole point of today is biodiversity. How do we measure biodiversity? We look at how abundant organisms are and then how many of those organisms are present. We're going to look for bats pretty deep into the park. There's another group that's looking for mammals. I think we have a salamanders group, maybe some fish. My uh, background and training is in uh, evolutionary ichthyology. So I study fish biology, uh, fish behavior, and more recently I've become involved in um, doing a lot of survey work in citizen science with regards to specifically fish in the Hudson River. Make sure they're in the bucket when they're counted. Eight, nine, ten. We found blue crab, Atlantic silverside, and striped bass, and we tallied up the different species that we found today. Macaulay students who are distributed on eight CUNY campuses um, all have a common seminar series that they take during their first two years of college. Um, and one of them is Science Forward, which they take in the fall of their sophomore year. The BioBlitz is part of that course, and it is a course about um, scientific literacies, the philosophy of science, and the basic skills that scientists have across all disciplines of work. For BioBlitz, I was in the Beetle Group on Saturday, and we would hike up at Inwood Hill Park and then collect different species of beetles and use large nets to like, catch them through trees and leaves. When we want to identify something that we found at the park, we'll use an app called iNaturalist, and in simplest terms, it's basically facial recognition, but for bugs instead of people. Once you take a picture, and we have a picture of a beetle as an example, so if you hit Next, you can see that they'll give you suggestions as to what species this specific specimen could belong in. Once we enter all of the paper data, then we'll have the full species list, and then we make that open to all of our students and, and to the public. And then the students use those data in our class called Science Forward to engage with the process of science and do their own research project. Lichen and moss, very interesting. Lichen are basically a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and an algae or cyanobacteria growing together. We're testing the salinity and the water temperature, and maybe later we'll get to test the uh, oxygen levels in the water to give us a good measure of the health of the river and the, and the river environment. Having worked on six bioblitzes and having had the opportunity to take nearly 3,000 students into New York City parks and help them see what's there and become excited and more um, thoughtful about the world around them um, has been, you know, extremely gratifying. You know, has it really even changed the way that I think about the city and interact with it? It's great to see that here in, in Manhattan, on Manhattan Island, we're still so close to the natural ecosystem. We're all part of one ecosystem together. Barry Mitchell, Urban U. Tom Slay is an award-winning poet and author. He's also a distinguished professor at Hunter College. His latest project focuses on the plight of refugees around the world. Abby Ashola has that story. It's just if, if you could shift your mind from thinking this is a refugee camp to this is where these people are gonna live for the rest of their lives. You know, you begin to get a sense of the magnitude of the problem, you know. I'm a distinguished professor at Hunter College in the MFA program in creative writing. Slay has written several books of poetry in his career. His most recent title, House of Fact, House of Ruin, was published alongside The Land Between Two Rivers, writing in an age of refugees. His first ever book of long-formed essays that tell the stories of people affected by famine and conflict. The book began totally by serendipity. I had no intention of writing a prose book of this kind. Uh, but, but back in uh, 2006 and 2007, I was invited to go to Lebanon and Syria to write about 
uh, the situation of Palestinians after the 2006 war. And that's really how this whole odyssey began. Along with the stories of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and Syria, the book also covers Somali refugees affected by a famine in 2011 that killed more than 250,000 people. The problems that you would encounter, uh, the things that refugees were going through, uh, were so profound that it really shifted um, your idea of this kind of scale of suffering. The only way I could adequately talk about what I felt was to describe a starving two-year-old boy. His head lolled in his mother's lap, and he seemed listless on the verge of coma or the apathetic drowse that precedes it. But his mother had been given by one of the matrons of the feeding station in downtown Mogadishu a nutritional biscuit made of vitamin-fortified peanut slurry called Plumpy Nut. And as she carefully unwrapped it, whether from the smell or some inner alarm built into the species, he roused himself. She gave it to him, his eyes suddenly focused, and he began to eat. After a few bites, as the sugars hit his system, his whole body gathered strength and he sat up, suddenly alert. He ate the biscuit slowly, and by the time he'd finished, he was taking in his surroundings, particularly the shiny silver foil that the biscuit had come in. He took the foil from his mother and began throwing it up in the air, playing with it, recovering in a few moments because of the sugars, the instinct to play. To be in the presence of a famine, um, that's totally changes your understanding of hunger um, and also, you know, there's a certain kind of um, stoicism and a weirdly kind of essential hopefulness about people when they're in this terrible, terrible situation. Slay also depicts a side of refugee life less told. He explains that there are many refugees who live in cities like Nairobi among natives, a fact that Western media tends to overlook. Refugees whom we mainly see are the refugees who live in camps, mainly because it's an easy story. You know, you can be a journalist, you can fly in, you know, you can have your hit of what I call disaster porn, <laughs> and then you can fly out. And that's not the kind of thing I want to do. Um, because when I'm trying to write my pieces, I, I, I'm not there to tell people how to solve problems. I'm not there to pretend to be an instant expert. I'm a cultural outsider. And the important thing for me is to be as upfront about what it is I know and what it is I don't know. Um, all of these women are at a feeding station and you can see they've got their children uh, with them. One of the most interesting things about, because of the way Somali society is, is that the men lead quite separate lives. You never saw a man ever at a feeding station. Wow. Abby Ashola for Urban U. Um, this month's For the Record focuses on Queens College, singing the praises of one very famous Queens alumni. <laughs> In 2018, more than 60 years after his first hit record, Paul Simon announced he would be embarking on his final tour, and he decided to hold his last show in his hometown Queens, just down the street from his alma mater, Queens College. 
In fact, one of his first songs was about a Queens College classmate. The song, He Was My Brother, was dedicated to his friend, Andrew Goodman, the civil rights worker who was killed for registering African-American voters in 1964 Mississippi. But Simon would always be that New York boy at heart, from that first album just out of Queens College as Simon and Garfunkel to becoming one of the biggest stars in the world. He never forgot where he came from. Singing about New York City winters in The Boxer, feeling groovy on the 59th Street Bridge song, or saying goodbye to Rosie, the queen of Corona, on Me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Funnily enough, however, Simon skipped his own graduation ceremony in 1963. It wasn't until 1997, when Queens College awarded him with an honorary doctorate, that he finally got to appear on the graduation stage. Hello, darkness, my old friend. And with those years between graduation ceremonies, his career as a songwriter and performer has seen him nominated for an Oscar, 35 Grammys, of which he won 16, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and be a recipient of the Kennedy Center Honors, the nation's highest tribute to performing artists. And in 2018, this CUNY grad comes homeward bound, back to where it all started in his backyard in Queens. Professor Jody Rory from John Jay College doesn't take matters sitting down. She wants what every other professor wants, to have her students completely engaged in their learning. So homework might include traveling to Puerto Rico as part of a relief effort. Let's take a look. I try to create fieldwork opportunities, even in a traditional teaching class, that brings them outside of the classroom into the community, whether it's a courtroom or to a nonprofit organization. The Hurricane Maria Relief Brigade is just that kind of nonprofit. Founded by Rora in response to the ongoing crisis in Puerto Rico, it consists of John Jay students who repair damaged homes and facilities and deliver much needed medical supplies to remote areas. At times, the students work alongside medical teams Rora also organizes. They are known as Doctors for Maria Relief. I want to make my students those type of transformers. And in order to do that, I need to provide them with what I didn't have, which was exposure in the classroom at a college level of what can really be possible. I didn't necessarily have somebody that did that with me. So after receiving her law degree and completing two doctoral programs in jurisprudence and transnational studies, Rora set her mind on teaching students to become agents of change. My goal was to really change the way that education was happening at a policy level, and I start by doing that in my classroom. In addition to teaching, Rora is project investigator and director of the Ronald H. Brown Law School prep program and director of the University of Houston Law Center pre-law pipeline program. Her dedication to her students is a reflection of her commitment to human rights worldwide. And the elimination of obstacles to the economic empowerment of women. It all began at home in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. I think my first exposure to human rights was as a child. I grew up in a neighborhood uh, where I witnessed a lot of social inequalities. And my parents, who are Puerto Rican, and my father in particular, I witnessed a lot of discrimination against him because of his accent. He served as Rora's inspiration and model. After work, he would take Jody and her brother to the farms in Vineland, New Jersey, where the migrant workers in the 1970s were predominantly Puerto Rican. They were getting paid very meager wages and being worked just unconscionable, laborious hours. I remember my father taking us through there and saying, this is where they have to go to the bathroom as they pick. This is where they have to sleep. Look at the condition of their sleeping quarters. They have no running water. This is not sanitary. And I remember looking at this going, these men are trapped here, and this is not right. And then my father would say, this has to change. Her father would set out cans of Keebler soda crackers for the workers to snack on, then give his daughter the workers' bill of rights to read to them. In Spanish, Jody, this is in English. I want you to read this to these workers in Spanish so they can know their rights and we would read their rights and we would figure out what was the problem. And my father would then go and meet with all these leaders in the Latino community 
and said, we have this problem, we have to fix it. So I grew up doing that. That's what I've known. So it's not that what motivates me, it's what I was taught. Those early lessons continue to this day at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. One of her students from the Hurricane Maria Relief Brigade shared her view of Professor Rara. Uh, Professor Roy was a, a huge inspiration because she uh, believes in her fight and her mission um, so much that everybody around her really has no other choice but to believe it too. <laughs> you know, like, it, there's that much belief though, like that's how you need to carry yourself. Judith Escalona for Urban U. Queens College postgraduate student Josephine Cook has the opportunity of a lifetime. She's headed to the UK to continue her studies on dance and neuroscience. This talented and lucky lady is one of 40 Americans receiving the Marshall Scholarship. The Marshall Scholarship is a postgraduate scholarship that allows Americans of high ability to study at any university in the United Kingdom. The UK Parliament created the grant in 1953 as a living gift to the United States to recognize the generosity of Secretary of State George C. Marshall and the Marshall Plan in the wake of World War II. We caught up with Josephine before she left. I'm going to do a PhD. That's what I'm going over to London to do. I plan on focusing my PhD specifically on the effects of dance, not just from a rehabilitative standpoint, but also just for a general cognitive benefit. Josephine knows very well what cognitive benefits dance can offer, as she was once rigorously training as a dancer. Injure my knee, unfortunately. It wasn't like a bad injury, didn't require surgery or anything, but it did leave my knee kind of weakened and I was having to dance on it over and over and over again. So I decided to take a step back um, from dancing. And so I always had an interest in the brain. You know, it's, it's this really cool thing in our heads that controls pretty much everything we do. Um, and the fact that we don't know so much, like we don't know that much about it is fascinating to me. Research shows that the more activity the brain gets, the more it can fight degenerative diseases, such as Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Through dance, you're drawing on so many different areas. It's not just, you know, um, the motor centers of your brain. It's not just moving. It's also, you know, there's visual information, there's auditory information, there's somatic information, so t like different um, sort of sensations about touch. And there's an emotional and a cognitive aspect to it. You have to think very hard about what you're doing when you're dancing. The Marshall Organization supports its students through the entire process and later through its broad network of professionals all over the world. I would love to at some point start a clinic that's a therapeutic center that's devoted to using arts, whether it's music, painting, dance to treat a wide array of neurological and psychiatric conditions. So not just, you know, Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, but anything from like stroke, which is not a disease, it's more of an injury, I guess you could say, um, to multiple sclerosis, which is more of an autoimmune disease, and then anything to, you know, like depression, which is very, very common in the population, or autism or that kind of thing. I think that the arts has great potential for helping all of these people enrich their quality of life. I'm Mari Amy for Urban U. We're going to leave you now with a performance by Grace Juhye Huang, accompanied by Zach Mandernek from the Queens College Aaron Copeland School of Music. For more information on any of our stories, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu or check out our Urban U Facebook page. Thanks for watching, and now let's check out Grace. <laughs>
Sempre volevo 